Do. I'm very excited to invite um, to the stage our panel this evening. Um, some of them may be familiar faces to you all. So we've got Amy Smith. So Amy, Amy and I probably I met, you, um, I don't know, I want to say maybe 10 months ago. And we just hit it off straight away. Uh, she's very, very yeah, good at what she does. She focuses on the uh, career coaching space, specifically millennials. So welcome, Amy. We've got Ahmed Imam, who is a property investment strategist and edutainer on LinkedIn. Yeah. So he raps on LinkedIn. So if you would like some entertainment, go and check him out. We've got Nathaniel Bibby, um, who, like I said, has been on LinkedIn eight, nine years um, and has done a lot of work and built a very successful business in the lead generation space and helping uh, his clients with that. And then we've got Beck Rowe, who is a corporate wellness uh, specialist, uh, who has, like I said, kindly donated uh, a free workshop this evening. So we're excited to have her here as well. So welcome, everyone. Oh, yes. That wouldn't be good, would it? Is that on? Hello? Okay, that's on. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you guys use those. Okay, so is that on? Yeah. To get started, um, this is usually the best question to start, just so we all um, understand a little bit about where they all got started with content creation, because just in case you guys don't know, um, all four of these, these um, leaders on LinkedIn, if you like, all create content for LinkedIn, um, have all been doing it for different periods of time. Um, the fact that they create content on LinkedIn is how we've all met each other. Um, so it's really interesting in that respect. So I'd love to hear from all of you, how did your content creation journey on LinkedIn start? Yeah, so, um, hi everyone, Amy here. Um, content for me actually only started at the beginning of this year. So I've been on LinkedIn since about 2011. I was using it very differently. I was using it through my career as a headhunter and a recruiter. So I was very much behind the scenes when it, when it came to LinkedIn. So I was officially a stalker on LinkedIn <laughs> and I would find you and I would recruit you. Um, but then in my own business was when I started to really use content. And so I really started probably around January this year. Um, since using content through LinkedIn, my following grew from 3,000 to over 15,000 now. So it really is true that it does really build that organic reach um, and it does build your network. So that's really when I got started. Cool. Um, we're down by one mic. I don't know if the other mic can... Uh... Oh, is it not working here? Hold on. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Armani Mam. I'm the director of a business called Metropole Property Strategists. Uh, I'm a property investment strategist. Um, I am also a property investor. Um, my journey with LinkedIn started about uh, nine months ago. Um, like uh, Amy and like uh, Sally, um, I grew my profile through content creation uh, and targeted content creation. Um, within nine months, I built up a following of about uh, 40,000 people. Um, and I'm now the most viewed uh, real estate person on LinkedIn globally, which is which is incredible. Wow. Um, and I say that not to brag, I say that because I'm really nothing special. So what we're going to talk about today is just the, the formula that a lot of us have used to grow our profiles um, and how that's benefited our business, how that's led to then lead generation um, and also um, you know, benefiting our personal brand. So it's been an incredible journey. Um, there are a lot of tips and tricks that we can pass on. Uh, a lot of things that we can teach you today to expedite your journey, so I hope you find it very helpful. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Nathaniel Bibby. Um, I started, when I started on LinkedIn, I was a salesperson trying to uh, get past a gatekeeper um, to try and target plastic surgeons in Melbourne. Um, <laughs> they have this thing called a practice manager, which is very well versed in not letting you through the front door or through the um, access to the surgeons through the telephone. So I thought I'd try this thing called LinkedIn. And at, at the time, you could not post content on LinkedIn. Uh, there was only 200 publishers worldwide that could publish articles on LinkedIn, the likes of Richard Branson, Tony Robbins, uh, Bill Gates, guys like that. And then LinkedIn one day said, you know what, we're going to start uh, allowing everybody to publish content and you know, people are just going to decide based on the engagement you know, what's going to get the most popular. So I started publishing articles and then they said they're going to do short form updates. So I started doing that. So it, like articles were the most effective to start with then short form updates, then when video came out, LinkedIn made it very clear that they were going to push um, that piece of content. So I th th I've been doing video since then, I'm riding the wave. Um, I've built my following probably not as fast as some of these guys. Um, it's been very much a slow um, build, um, but it's been very targeted because I do do lead generation, I do do targeted outreach. So most of the people in my network are um, there by, by my choice, by decision, because I've been 
reaching out to them, not um, just receiving connection requests. So yeah, happy to be here. Good evening, my name is, is that working? Yeah. <laughs> my name is Beck Rose, so I am a sports physio by background, so I'm not naturally very great at marketing. So when I quit my job one day and decided to up and start my own business, it was a little challenging, um, to say the least, at, start, at the start to try and build up a bit of a following and get business for myself. So obviously I had to pay the bills, so I had to sort of swallow my pride and find a way that I could start marketing without embarrassing myself. I also have two brothers who like to take the mickey out of me, so I decided to opt for LinkedIn because there was a less of a chance that my brothers would see me <laughs> <laughs> marketing myself, and it's turned out to be the best thing I ever did. So I've managed to build my entire business now through purely using LinkedIn as my only marketing approach. So I'm probably, I would say, the least experienced out of these guys, but I've I swear by it and I use video content creation now probably over the last three to six months and have managed to build up a bit of a following um, and probably a few people who don't like me that much as well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I swear by it. So that's kind of why I'm here. I love that. Awesome. <laughs> so I think um, there's probably a little bit of inspiration there because yeah. these four as well as myself, when we all got started, um, none of us were content marketing specialists or anything to that effect. Um, so I'd love to hear from you guys um, in terms of, Given you had no experience, so to speak, in creating content um, from a marketing perspective, how, when you first began, how did you come up with content ideas or how do you come up with content ideas now? So firstly, like many of you had sort of shared this on the screen before, I was freaking terrified. <laughs> I did not want to put out any content at first and I made myself do it, which is, um, I think, the way that you start is if there's something that's a, a challenge for you, you make yourself do it until you get good at it. So that was my approach. Um, I started off sharing other people's content first. That was a very safe lane for me, particularly when I was still employed when I wasn't uh, starting my own business yet. So that was a very safe lane. Then I uh, took to videos and it took me around six hours to <laughs> do my first video. Um, three minutes to film it and then five hours and 57 minutes I sat there and panicked and didn't want to post it. Um, but I did it and I think that's what you need to do is just sort of make yourself do it. So for me it was a challenge. It's not something that I thought um, came quite naturally for me. Like I'm not really a sharer on Instagram or Facebook or anything like that. So um, I just took on the challenge and got better over time. Uh, yeah, I had a very similar experience and I, I think everyone's going to you know, relate to, to something that, that we all say here. Um, I was absolutely terrified the first time I did my video, you know, and I wasn't a natural presenter on video at all. Um, so I was trying to record a 30 second video in my car that took me about 50 minutes to do, um, just because I was self-conscious and I kept watching the video back and I didn't like the way I looked or the way I said something or the way I stuttered or the way I stuttered. Um, and it took me 50 minutes to do and I was sweating buckets um, and then finally decided to proceed. Um, you know, so for me, and we saw a lot of the words that popped up when um, the topic of video content creation came up, especially video content creation. We all feel awkward about it. We know we all feel uncomfortable. Um, I don't think there's anyone in, there, in this room that would watch a video of themselves and say, boy, I love the way I look. You know what I mean? <laughs> Everyone's got a thing. I hate my nose. I hate my chin in videos. I hate the fact that I've got grey hair. Um, <laughs> nobody likes the way they look. Um, but you just have to do it, you know, and you'll soon realise that nobody actually is as focused about your appearance or, or your voice as much as you are. What they're focused on is the message. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you've got a message to deliver, uh, and it's a message that you know can add value to someone else, you've got the responsibility to do that. You know, and, and you'll be amazed at how forgiving and supportive LinkedIn, especially as a platform, is. Probably not so much Facebook anymore. <laughs> but LinkedIn especially, you'll get a lot of support, you'll get a lot of encouragement, and you will actually add value. Um, in terms of content creation ideas, stick to what you know initially. You know, everybody here has about two or three topics that they can write down on a piece of paper that they know like the back of their hand, right? It could be something that you speak about with clients every single day. Write those topics down on a piece of paper and dissect them um, because everything can be put into a 20 or 30 second or 50 second video that can add value. You might just stick to maybe one point per video, whatever it is, but just get started and just get comfortable with it. Um, but know that no one cares about you as much as you do, okay? And just get started. 
Thank you. Um, so we're going to go back to the plastic surgeon story. <laughs> um, so the conversion rates, just in a nutshell, right, when I contacted 10 surgeons, I got six responses, four meetings, made one sale. Very scalable system. So I could contact 20 surgeons the next week and I end up with two sales. Um, the business I was working for, we grew it from eight employees to uh, 120 within 18 months, and it was sold to an ASX listed group. When you grow a business that fast through a lead generation strategy that no one else is using, a lot of people ask you what you are doing. And uh, one of the one of the parties that asked me was the Digital Marketing Institute, and they asked me to create a LinkedIn training course. So my, my business like is LinkedIn training and LinkedIn marketing, so it's it's quite relevant for the platform. So I've never had a challenge coming up with content ideas because I've always been asked loads and loads of questions by my clients so how does that um, how what advice can I give to you guys is, is really um, focus on the people that you serve and the questions that they're asking you and the problems that they have and create content that solves that I think that's the most effective way to go about it and that way you, you are serving your target audience not just you know creating content for whoever wants to consume it without having some business outcomes associated to it um, I think my main advice when it comes to content creation is similar to what I would say to my physio patients, which is always like, start really small with things that you feel comfortable with, and then when the pain decreases, like gradually build your way up. <laughs> so I think I started with like scientific facts because that's what my specialty is, and I felt like surely if it's science, people won't kind of abuse me and tell me that I'm wrong, and that's not necessarily the case because some people <laughs> don't believe in science. But I did feel like that was a nice way to sort of feel comfortable with the platform, and then as my um, ability to sort of engage with the audience grew, I started to then write things myself and then eventually moved on to the video content stuff, which now feels, like Sally said, totally fine for me. So I think it's just a matter of putting yourself, as Brené Brown says, out into the arena and not worrying about what all the critics think. And if they are, mm. if they're out on LinkedIn, kind of sledging you, then they're probably not people that you really care about their opinion anyway. I think. Can I just ask you on that note? It feels like you probably had a lot of criticism. Yes. Um, <laughs> I know myself That's as well. I think it's a blonde hair thing. Something happens. People are like, no. they're not supposed to be smart, right? So, I'd love to hear from you. When you started putting content out, um, what were some of the things that you had sort of thrown at you? Um, be it about age, you know, gender, all sorts of stuff. People questioning your credibility. Um, and then I'd like to love to hear from you guys on the same because I know everyone's had experience with trolls before, um, and I'm sure someone else will be able to explain what a troll is better than myself. Um, but yeah, what what happened when people started criticizing you and then how did you deal with that internally to overcome it so you didn't stop producing content on LinkedIn? I'm probably making it sound slightly worse than it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a very sensitive human being, so I don't be affected by it. But there were I've had several comments, like I think you've mentioned Sally, similar things, but people telling me that my voice is annoying. I do have a cold at the moment, so I normally am not this annoying, but I do have like a slightly chipmunky kind of voice, I think. So, you know, people are like, your voice is so fake and annoying. And I'm like, oh, I mean, that really hurts and it's not necessary. Um, I'm just out there trying to spread, spread information about wellness. Um, and, you know, people questioning things. Like I recently put a post up about drinking. I had a lot of inboxes from people being like, if you've got an alcohol problem, you should contact a professional. And I was like, I, just, I said I used to have one drink and I was like, it's not. I'm fine. Um, so I think the important thing is to remember, stay true to yourself. And I think I always think there's this really great um, interview with Ricky Gervais and he talks about how <laughs> he was walking down the street and a homeless person is like in a bin covered in their own SHIT and they yelled out at him, you C word. He's like, would I take that seriously? Or would I probably just laugh, not think about it again for the rest of the day and walk off? And I think the people that like troll you on these mediums are probably kind of like a man in a bin on the street. So. <laughs> 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 but it's true. Like if you're on a professional medium and you're having a go at someone for their voice, I don't really, yeah, I don't care. Um, yeah, I've, Oh, I had lots of experiences, of course. Um, I mean, and, and I think that it's it's good if if I think it's good to get negative comments if there's like um, some explanation and you can learn from it and make your content better. But if there's no learning there, then just I, I just think there's, I just don't see why it needs any attention whatsoever, um, and just keep moving on. Um, it's going to happen when you get popular, and it's a, it is a big reason why people will bottleneck at a certain level because they don't like the negative criticism that comes with being popular and having a lot of people look at your shit, but like it does happen. And if you look at like um, anybody that's popular on YouTube, whether it be Tony Robbins or Gary Vaynerchuk or 
um, Donald Trump's probably a bad example, <laughs> but um, look through the comments. There's a lot. There's way more negativity than there is positivity. It's just the way it is. Um, so you've got to be prepared for that. Um, and if there's no value in what they're saying, then just ignore it. Uh, I love this topic, by the way. <laughs> um, about a month ago, I actually had someone direct message me um, saying, "Hi, Ahmed. Um, I noticed a mistake on your profile." your sideburns are uneven. <laughs> um, so like, like Nathaniel said, sometimes it's going to be constructive, um, sometimes not so much. Um, if, it's, if it's feedback that I can take on board and, and then work to improve on myself, I'll 100% take that on board and, and I'll welcome that. If it's feedback that is just simply toxic, then I don't need to give that time. I'll either ignore that comment or I'll just respond with something as simple as appreciate your feedback and move on and I don't give that any more time. Uh, but does everyone know what a troll is? Yeah, yeah no? No. Um, a troll is pretty much someone that goes out... So who, who asked the question? Okay. <laughs> a troll is pretty much someone that goes out of their way to say disparaging comments. Um, and it's almost become a bit of a culture, you know, to try and get a bit of a rise out of you and have you respond. And all of a sudden you're in a dialogue with them about something that's completely irrelevant. Um, and it's become pretty big on other platforms like Facebooks and Instagrams. Not so much LinkedIn... Um, but yeah, when you do get a lot of attention or a lot of engagement, there's of course going to be one or two people that will disagree with you and a few that just want to get a bit of a rise out of you. So how much attention you want to give is completely up to you. Um, so for me, I haven't had uh, too many bad experiences, less so than what I actually thought when I was first putting out content. However, I've got millennial in my headline and most people get offended just by that, which is quite <laughs> interesting. Um, so anytime I mention the word millennial in any of my content, someone's always got an opinion about millennials. But I don't mind that because it sparks engagement, it sparks conversation. Mm. So I don't mind unless, you know, it is a blatant personal attack on someone or something. But I don't mind everyone putting forward their opinions and sort of creating that discussion. And I want it to be, you know, when I'm thinking of putting out content, I'm thinking about the people that are reading the content in my network and consuming it. I want it to be a good experience for them as well. So I have no issue in going in and just deleting or blocking people that are just being blatantly rude or just over the top. Um, that's just the way I deal with it. Um, because I want to make sure that when people are sort of viewing content, if people have got all different opinions, that's great. But I want people to be able to express that and be comfortable enough to sort of share that um, without someone you know, coming over the top of them. Um, and the other experience, I guess, I didn't really expect putting out content on LinkedIn is I had a few marriage proposals, so I'll those ones and turn them down. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> so despite all the negativity, we've all, um, I know at least myself, and I'm confident all four of you, um, since we've started creating content on LinkedIn, a lot has happened for us, um, you know, positively for our careers and or business, depending on your circumstance. Do you want to speak about maybe some of the things, um, the biggest things that have happened since you, you took that leap and really made yourself uncomfortable starting putting content out? What are some of the good things that have happened? Yeah. Um, so for me, there's been opportunities that have come my way that have been totally left field and, and not on my radar at all. So it really does open you up to a lot of different opportunities. And a lot of the opportunities that have come have actually been people that have never engaged in any of my content. They might not have liked anything or commented on anything, yet they're watching and they're looking at what you're doing and they'll send you through a direct message afterwards. So, you know, I've got different speaking gigs and things from it and I've never intentionally put myself out there as a speaker, um, but that's that's come through with my LinkedIn as well. Um, I've had people that were in my networks from in my corporate life that were three or four or even five levels above me, I guess, in seniority that have since reached out and said, now can you, can you coach me? Because they've actually seen what I've been doing to position myself and brand myself online. And so there's things like that that have just sort of come full circle in a way, um, and it's been really cool. Uh, my goal was to build my personal brand to support the business brand, um, and I've very much done that. Um, and anyone that is a business owner or at least within marketing understands how much those marketing costs are to do that externally. You know, keep in mind that you're able to create some content, make yourself visible, and do that all for free. You know, it's going to cost you your time more or less, but you can do that all for free, and, it's, and that, that's a beautiful thing. Um, how it's um, helped me um, is that it's almost doubled my conversion rate purely out of social proof. 
right? So when people want to know about your business, they're going to go to your website, they're going to look at your services, about us section, learn about your business. When people then are going to meet with you, they're going to go to your LinkedIn, um, understand who you are, um, get to know you a little bit more personally. And so what I found is that before clients are actually seeing me, potential clients uh, are seeing me, they're going to my LinkedIn profile. They're looking um, you know, a bit more about what I do. They're seeing my videos, seeing I'm a, um, you know, I position myself as an expert in my space. And before they actually have that meeting, they've more or less made their decision. And all I have to do is turn up and, and be consistent and I've noticed my conversions increase. So for me, it's been personal brand, social proof, and it very much has helped me uh, within conversions in the business. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I was generating leads for a long time um, before I started posting any content, and so I can compare, you know, what content did for me because um, I was literally generating, you know, 100 leads a month before I was posting content. Um, now I, I don't generate that many leads a month, and I don't need to because the, the conversion rate is five times as high, um, you know, and I'm positioned as a thought leader. But I, I think that if you're in business to business, your decision makers are spending time on LinkedIn. The statistics say they are spending time on LinkedIn and it is influ influencing their customer journey. And you'll find that the statistics also say that there's more people involved in the B2B decision making process these days as well. Um, so there's more people to cons you know, that you need to communicate with. So doing it one to many is a very effective way of doing it. Um, one of the pieces of content, because I, I know that we probably all have struggled with creating content ideas and I've made it very straightforward for, my, for myself from the start. I had a Q&A where um, people could ask questions with a hashtag, ask Nat, and then I could answer them in the videos. Well, you know, I'm providing value to what people want. Um, another content pillar I had was an interview series where I'd interview entrepreneurs who are making an impact, and it's called LinkedIn Heroes. And we've had Sally on the series, and Amy's going to be on it shortly. Um, and it's opened a lot of doors because I thought, well, you know, why don't I get an Olympic champion on? I had Stephanie Rice on. I thought, why don't I get some of my business heroes? I've had Kerwin Ray. I'm interviewing Grant Cardone soon. I mean, my business network, as a result of creating content on LinkedIn, is completely different from the guy that was getting knocked back by practice managers <laughs> back in the day. And then it's all the result of content. It's all literally just perception um, and being able to add a value through content. So definitely encourage all of you to do it because your competitors are not, they're not doing it. And that's, what, that's why it's so effective. Just, you can go into a saturated market and do the same thing as everyone else and you're not going to be different. But you do it somewhere where your competitors aren't doing it and all of a sudden you've got something special that no one else has um, and it positions you as, it, it eliminates competition to be honest. Because all of a sudden you're sitting down with a prospect and then not speaking to three other providers. They're only speaking to you because you're, you're the expert, you're the authority. Um, I think the main thing for me, which is going to sound really cheesy, but the reason that I got into the business that I'm in is to try and actually make a difference to people's daily lives by just sharing little snippets of like science-based health tips. So it's given me a platform of people who probably otherwise wouldn't seek out health advice, which I think is really valuable. And that's what I love about the corporate world as well. Um, and as I said, all of my business connections and every single bit of work that I've got has been through LinkedIn. So I've gone from being at the stage where I was like, that's it, I'm going to have to shut up shop because I'm living off baked beans to now having a, an okay income, which is really great. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think just from the perspective of if you are starting a business or you've got a side hustle or what have you, it's just the ultimate unembarrassing way to kind of boost your um, connection network of people that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get in touch with. So I'd love to hear from you guys in terms of obviously when we put content out and we get exposure, we get engagement and it generates opportunities. That's great for us and our careers and our businesses. What um, are some things that you've done or that you do that you can share with the audience in terms of trying to improve the success in terms of the performance for content? Because I know myself personally, when I first got started, I had to build so much momentum and it was just slow. So the first time when I first started posting content, no one would see it because the algorithm didn't, the algorithm didn't like my content. So what have you done and what can people do to gr increase the chances of their content actually getting as much exposure as possible and being successful to provide them with results quicker? I think one thing that I have done is to start telling stories, which everyone mm, does on LinkedIn, cool. and it feels a bit tacky at first. But I do think, as we know, humans love a story. And I think when you're just giving out facts, I found it, you know, got a little bit of engagement. People, people want to know about you or they want to know about a story of a, a patient that I've had or what have you. And those, those are the ones, the posts that get the most engagement. Um, I also 
find the videos for me get a lot better engagement um, than written content. Um, and I find the time of day, I know Sally mentioned that she kind of posts all different times of day. I obviously don't have as big a following. So I find early morning, like between seven and eight for me is the best. I don't know about you guys, um, but I've found playing around with the time and obviously just like constantly trying new things and assessing. Like it has to be, again, a little bit scientific in the way that you're always like try a new um, time of day or try like, I don't know, like obviously video content versus written content and then actually look at the data as a result of that look at the views look at the likes and the comments and engaging a lot with other people on LinkedIn and like making some LinkedIn friends in a genuine way like people that are in an industry that is similar to you reaching out commenting on their posts and writing back to people that comment on your posts so I think just like being a good friend in the real world it's kind of the same and then they'll um, give back to you in the same way you've done to them. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, without a doubt, collaboration. Like when you're starting out, like if you if you find somebody that's got the same audience you, that you uh, as you, they're in a complementary in industry or even in the same industry. Um, one of the first articles I published that did really well was the six LinkedIn ex the six biggest LinkedIn experts advice. I don't know something like that. Where I interviewed six other LinkedIn experts. And I just asked them what their thoughts were. I just made sure none of them were in my city, you know. <laughs> um, but um, collaboration's huge. I mean, find somebody that, it's a lot more fun that way. Find somebody that's already producing content that you like and, and interview them. You'd be surprised um, if you uh, contact somebody and tell them that you think their content's awesome and you want to interview them, how many people say yes. And then all of a sudden you're tapping into their audience as well and you're learning. And the biggest thing you can, um, biggest mistake you can make is not doing anything. So if you're sitting there thinking about it every day, you're making a mistake. You just got to get out there and be active. So why don't you just start by, you know, finding people that are already producing content that you like, the sound of, maybe interview them, share some of their ideas, and then at least you're making progress because you're learning along the way and finding out what, you know, works and what doesn't. Um, I think the biggest fear that we all have is that we post something and you get no likes, you get no comments, <laughs> and it just kind of sits there idle and you feel very, very lonely and embarrassed. Um, so there are three things that I've, I've done to, to make sure I boost my engagement and, and to get wider reach on my posts. And that is connecting, engaging, and posting. Um, so when you connect, um, LinkedIn has an amazing search functionality. Make sure it's very, very targeted in how you connect. Reach out to people in your industry, reach out to colleagues, uh, friends, uh, but obviously if you're there for business, make sure it's targeted and reach out to those targeted connections. I personally aimed for about 50 targeted connections per day. Um, I know that's a, a little ambitious, but that's how I really built up my momentum. Um, I engaged a lot, um, and to Beck's point, it is so important. Um, dedicate time every day to just engaging. You know, go on your feed and engage for about 30 minutes and, and be targeted with that engagement. Find people in your industry, in your space that you admire, that you look up to, that are currently receiving a lot of engagement. Um, and leave a valuable comment on their post. Um, and do that for, let's say, half an hour per day, because the law of reciprocity will say that if you do that consistently, they will then engage on your posts. And the third thing is posting. Dedicate time every single week to posting, whether it's twice or once a week, twice a week. Just make sure it's absolutely consistent and make sure it'll appeal to the people that you've just connected with, okay? The audience that you've just connected with. The, the key is to just make sure that you're always in the feed. Okay, and you can be in the feed either by posting or by engaging. And if you're always in the feed, you're gonna be a lot more visible. People will start to follow you, people will start to interact with you, but that requires consistency and making sure you're always in that feed. Mentioned as well, um, particularly the first hour when you post something is really important. So once you post something with the LinkedIn algorithm, it generally wants to see if people are really engaged with that piece of content as well. So if someone's commented, you know, or I get a few comments within that first hour, I make sure that I'm really uh, responding to people and that helps to sort of boost that engagement as well. Um, I also use probably about five to 10 hashtags on my posts, um, a variety of macro and micro, like Sally was saying before as well, um, just to make sure that you're, you're thrown up in different areas there. Um, and the engagement piece is a big one as well. So um, I do dedicate time every day uh, to engage with other people as well. And I do it strategically too. So I'm just not sort of commenting, oh, that, that's a great, nice article. Like I'm actually putting some thought into those comments um, because again, like Ahmed was saying, you want to be in that news feed. So if they're not coming across a piece of my content, they're coming across a comment that I've made and it 
might be a really relevant you know, comment with someone in that industry um, who picks it up and then sees my profile. So it's just a continual <coughs> loop in this circle. Um, so it is really all around consistency um, and activity. Beautiful. Are you guys happy to open up to Q&A now? Yep. Does anyone have any sure. questions? We've got a few? Yeah, okay, I might swap mics. Will that reach over to... We'll make it work. Yep. We'll make it work. Beautiful. Do you have a question there? Go. Just speak into the mic so they can hear it. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just on, I mean, everything you spoke about tonight is based really if you've got a business, but if you're looking at an area that you're, so from my circumstance, I'm looking at um, relocating to a different country, I'm going to be back in the job market, I have an idea of what I want to do. So where you're coming from tonight is, you know, you run your own businesses. But is that pretty re relevant to doing that personally? So for instance, I've always been in sales, is posting your stuff there, getting noticed by the employers, standing out from the crowd if you're going to, you know, your, your ideas and your, um, I suppose, living your own values and things like that. Is that what you would recommend from coming from a different area than having your own business? Yeah. Do you understand? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yep. yeah. So um, that, that's where I coach in, is, is people that are career focused and looking to really position themselves in the industry um, and the area that they're wanting to work. So it's exactly the same process. You might just do it in a different way as well, and it would be probably um, much more targeted. So if this, um, specifically, if you're looking at locations of where you wanted to work, you'd be looking at connecting with some really influential people um, in those locations. You'd be thinking about some content that would be really relevant for them um, so that you're sort of attracting them into your world, into your network, um, and other companies as well. If there's a company that you'd really like to work for, Engage in their content, get in front of their face. That's absolutely the best way to do it. Yeah, thanks. One five, yeah. yeah. Um, keep in mind, LinkedIn is very, very young relative to other platforms as well, mm -hmm. right? I know it's been around for since what 2002, um, but in terms of where we're at now, there is so much blue ocean with LinkedIn, mm -hmm. it's incredible. So, you've got all the time in the world to position yourself as an expert, as a subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. So, I guess figure out what kind of space you want to be in. Um, and you can simply put out content that you know is going to help people to know you, like you, trust you. That's yeah. it. Um, and, and if that means talking about your personal values and getting people to know you that way, um, or, or starting to talk about some tips and tricks with, with some particular subject, that all helps. Uh, and consistency will really help that as well in terms of um, putting you out there. Cool. Beautiful. We've got another question here. Yeah, is any of you use other platforms? Um, can you just can contrast and compare the content you'd use for LinkedIn versus whatever else you use. Which platform? Oh, I use that seven or eight, but wow. just try them to see what works <laughs> yeah. and follow up and yeah. yeah. So uh, we've got a, a food business. Um, I still use Pinterest, Twitter, uh, Facebook. You can almost list them all. Yep. Yeah. <sighs> um, okay, so I guess from my perspective, like I do use. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. I don't. I'm not active on Pinterest, but I have an account there. Um, Twitter, um, and I post blog content. So I'm doing all of that as well. And I think it's really important from my perspective. I mean, this is just the value that I think. I guess I can add is is to diversify. Um, I follow Gary Vaynerchuk's advice here, and I I focus 80% on my main platform, which is LinkedIn, and I put 20% of my time into the others. Mainly because I just see how quick it's changing, and you know, Sally touched on how Facebook um, you used to get a lot of organic reach, and then all of a sudden, bang, they change the algorithm. You could have a hundred thousand followers on your Facebook page that you invested to build, and now you can't reach any of them without investing in content. And you know, if you if you're putting all your eggs in one basket on LinkedIn, and that happened, um, it happened to us on Pinterest. Are you are you B to B or B to C? Uh, sort of both, but yeah. Sort of both. So, I mean, my um, one thing to consider maybe if you're in that circumstance is things like Pinterest and, and, and Instagram are probably um, more defined for B2C, right, with a very, you know, very visually focused, whereas LinkedIn you could use to tap into the B2B element and more of a positional authority in that space. Instagram doesn't work for us particularly, but Pinterest yeah. was working really well. They changed their algorithm. Mm -hmm. We went to 10% of our um, connection. Yeah. yeah, and so like... To, Transferring that audience over to the other platforms because the average link, uh, sorry, social media user has 5.5 accounts apparently. 
Um, so they do use other channels. Um, so if you're doing cross marketing where it's like, okay, the end of the article on LinkedIn, it's like check out our Pinterest you know, page on that, um, check out what we're doing on Instagram. Um, cross marketing, something a lot of people miss out on. You know, I'm, I'm very big on it. Like I do uh, post very different content on Instagram than I do on LinkedIn. Uh, if any of you follow me on Instagram, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but like, if anything's not suitable for LinkedIn, it ends up on Instagram. Um, and I, I really do invest in YouTube. Like, I really, you know, I, I only have 800 and something odd subscribers there. You know, compared to 30,000 on Instagram, 30,000 on LinkedIn. Um, it's not. It doesn't seem like a lot, but because it's a search engine, you know, the longer the content sits on YouTube, um, the better it does. And so it's evergreen content, which you don't really, you know, don't have as much on on. Um, social media platforms because YouTube's not it is, is a search engine it's not a social media site that's it, to speak of yeah mm-hmm. question over here. Um, I just wanted to ask a question around um, like the answer is probably personal choice but I think um, Ahmad you continually use the word consistency and I mm. totally agree but um, how do you kind of I mean I've got I've had a following a couple of people and then um, just being a little bit annoyed by how much they actually post and then the value is not really there and then I start to unfollow them. So yeah. I guess uh, probably the long way of asking you, how do you knock these people off? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah very good question. Yeah, so um, and and when, I say, when I say consistency, I don't mean um, to compromise quality either. Um, Only if you've got quality content should you put it out. You should never just post for the sake of posting. Um, Gary Vee's formula is actually volume, you know, and and he posts uh, about five to six times per day on LinkedIn um, and every other social media platform for that matter. And granted, he's got a team to do that. Um, But keep in mind, and, and it depends on what kind of product or service you're offering. For me, for example, it's property and property investment. Um, I have to be front of mind, all right? Because people don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to go buy a four-bedroom house in the eastern suburbs, right? <laughs> um, but when it comes time to then making that decision or wanting to make that decision, I'll say, oh, God, who's that guy on LinkedIn that talks about that? Um, so I, I want to be front of mind. But I completely agree. Don't ever post just for the sake of posting. Uh, make sure there's some sort of value add. Make sure, making sure you're providing some sort of advice or tip or trick. Or at the very least, if it's not an educational video, an entertaining video or an uplifting video, um, something that you can give back to your audience. Um, How often is too often? Look, I personally post about four or five times a week. Um, And I feel that's that's right by me. Um, There are people that would disagree with that. There are people that would do a lot more, people that would do a lot less. But when I say consistency, I don't mean it has to be every day. I mean, make sure it's consistent for you, right? If all you can do is once per week, and that's what you can commit to, then do it once per week. And if that's one quality video per week, then that's completely fine. But make sure you do that every single week, every Thursday or every Friday or whatever it might be. Another question? Thank you. I have a question for Nathan. Yes. Uh, back to the story about you contacting all the plastic surgeons. Yes. Uh, first of all, can you forget everyone? <laughs> What's that? Can you recommend one? All right. <laughs> joking, joking. Um, no, my, my actual question is how do you, did you write your content in such a way that you're not always talking about your own product or your own service? Because when I'm writing content, the problem I usually have is that I write too much about myself and uh, that can be perceived as salesy or yeah. covered up. Uh, marketing material, and yeah. how do you keep it genuine while still you are the main guy? Yeah, well, what, do, what do you do? Um, I work in marketing. Okay, cool. Well, look, uh, your solution, um, your service, your product has no value without the problem it solves. And so if, you, if you're just talking about the solution and what you offer, it's not valuable because you haven't built or defined the problem well enough for it to have any value. Does that make sense? So I would focus on the problem that you solve, even more than you, w- than you would talk about the solution. In fact, like, so people um, forget that a lot of the time your clients, they don't necessarily know what the solution is, otherwise they wouldn't have the problem in the first place. And so being able to talk about the pain and frustration um, and, you know, so like, for example, if somebody is using traditional marketing methods and they're not getting results, how's that affecting their business? How's that affecting turnover? How's that affecting their home life with family? And w- how does that feel? 
Because when you explain to people the problem and you define it better than they can in their, you know, in their own language, they actually automatically assume that you have a solution. That you, you know, does that make sense? Is that, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, educating about. people yeah. on the problem of the, or creating content that really highlights the problem. Like five reasons why you need to A, B, C. You know, um, yeah. if you don't do X, Y, Z, then A, B, C is going to happen. So you're really highlighting and pointing out that your service is required. And do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, but then like, would you then create at the, the end need. still do your sales switch at the end or just keep it at the solution? That's it. Mm. Yeah, and as long as you've added value, yeah, by all means, add all call to action at the end, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you'll notice as well, like one thing that I'll, a tip I'll give you, a little hack. <laughs> um, I've done a lot of articles and the headlines that work best are always got a negative slant on them. So like mm -hmm. the three mistakes that people make is always going to do better than the three things people do right. You know, three things not to do is always going to be better than, you know. So like people are actually more interested in, in, in the negative, you know, um, perspective on things what not to do, and, and most people are making mistakes, right? Most of your clients, you know, the people that you want to help, because they, they've got the problem. And the so, art of clickbait is to create curiosity, where people just have to watch it. Yeah, right? and the best, I think the best it. strategy to use is that, so if you are doing like long form articles, is at the end you have a lead magnet, so it's actually a link to go off of LinkedIn, fill in their details to download something of value, and then you've got them on your email marketing list. And then, you know, that's where content marketing becomes more of a holistic strategy because then you're guiding people through the customer journey, not just targeting the awareness stage. Because by the way, if you're doing organic content on LinkedIn, you are targeting the awareness stage, okay? Because you don't know if people, you know, if, uh, how far they are down the customer journey. Um, it's not like when you run an ad and you know they've watched 50% or more of your videos or they've clicked on so many things and blah, 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 blah. So if you are creating content, it needs to be to target the awareness stage. Otherwise, you, you, if you focus on people that are already um, you know, in the decision-making stage, it's too small a portion of the audience that you're targeting that it won't get enough engagement for them to even see it. Does that make sense? We've got another question over here. Um, many of you have uh, talked about no, hashtags, one. macro, micro. I just wanted to give you an example on both. Touch on it. Do you want to go? Oh no, I'll pass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like a macro one for me is just hashtag business. Like that's just huge. That could be relative to anything. Um, probably a more micro hashtag in my niche would be like next gen leaders or Gen Y or something like that. Um, or even, you know, more specific when it comes to like millennial careers or something like that, right? So um, I have trended in hashtag business before, so it's not like you can't trend in the, the macro ones, it's not like you can't be seen, but I find having a, a mix of the two uh, are pretty good as well. So I'll probably use, you know, five to ten, it just depends on the piece. I make them super relevant to that piece of content as well. Um, what would be the split? Oh, it just depends, I guess. I would just sort of have a look to see what was most relevant for that piece of content. So if it was something that was, you know, really specific, um, or even, you know, if I posted about this event and I was getting people here, um, I would post more about, you know, networking event Sydney or GA Sydney, and I'd make it really, really specific. Um, others that I would post that might be a little bit more general about, you know, how to retain your millennial staff, I could do business, I could hashtag employee engagement, I could do a few broader things Are you there. typically using the suggested hashtag? Sorry? Are you typically using the suggested, suggested hashtag? Yeah, I'll, I'll take them into account, but I don't necessarily use them, because sometimes I can get it wrong as well. So I think about, you know, for my network, I'd be thinking, who, who do I want to get this in front of, um, and what is it that they're typically interested in, or what, how they're going to find it? So can I just add to that as well? Um, you, you might want to also think about creating your own unique hashtag as well. Okay, so I've, I've got hashtag Man, which is very creative, I know. Um, but you can create whatever you want. And the reason being is video content actually disappears from the post section of LinkedIn, um, of your platform after about nine to 12 months. It just disappears. All right, so the link... The link is still active, but it disappears. And so if you have your own hashtag and you put your own hashtag on every single post, and then you just type in that hashtag into the search functionality, it's, it's collated every <laughs> single post that you have. Um, and ev every time someone uses your hashtag, it'll collate that within there as well. Um, so it's a great way to keep track of your content. Um, and people can also then follow your unique hashtag as well to find your content. So, so you'd have your unique hashtag plus maybe five, 10 other 
um, suggested hashtags as well. Thank you. Beautiful. Go. We've got another question over here. Hi. So my question, have you ever deleted content before from your Facebook account? And oh, if so, why? Yeah. There's a question, have I ever deleted content? Have you ever deleted content? And if so, why? <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> oh, very good question. Yeah. Um, yes, I've deleted content before if I feel like there's been a really big error um, or if it didn't upload something correctly or I, I didn't uh, you know, word something correctly. Um, yeah, I can't think of any other reason why I would have deleted, but I don't know if you guys have better stories or more entertaining stories than that. <laughs> I, I, I removed a picture once. I, <laughs> I, I upset a few people. Um, <laughs> I made a mistake. Um, so. I posted an article about uh, why you should keep posting on social media over the Christmas holidays, and the head image was um, uh, about 20 uh, women with um, red bikinis on and Santa hats walking out of the ocean. <laughs> and uh, I upset a few, a few people. Um, <laughs> and uh, at first, I didn't think too much of it. Like, I was like, I'm calling you out, Nathaniel. This is sexist, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, well, you know, it's Australia, summertime, I don't know. Um, and then in the end, when I'd, I actually went and visited the woman that, that did the post because she was in South Melbourne around the corner, I thought, oh, this would be interesting. So I went around to see her and I said, and I got some feedback and I, and I actually realized that I'd offended her and that was not my intention at all. Um, with, the, with, the, with the content that I'm posting, that is not, not what I want to achieve. And so I changed the image and I publicly apologized <laughs> if I did offend anyone. Um, that's one that, that does spring to mind because that was the first experience I had really with somebody like really calling me out in a negative way and I learned a lot from it, so it was good. I, oh, just as a side thing, I think we, we maybe have spoken about this, but deleting comments I think is like a controversial one because obviously, again, when you get negative feedback, um, whether or not to leave it there and like let it sit there and fester on your post or whether to delete it I think is a tricky one and I've definitely deleted comments in the past particularly referring to my anatomy and that sort of thing, just because I feel like it's not a necessary part of the post. And I think it's kind of up to, I remember Sally kind of said something on this, but I think it's up to you and how, how you feel about things. But I just think if it's taking away from what you're trying to offer the community, then it's not, it's okay, I think, to get rid of something. Beautiful, we've got another question over here. Um, I'm picking up on something Sally spoke about earlier in the sense that LinkedIn um, it's often used for B2B more than B2C, and there's that mentality that businesses use it more. Um, and I was reading a piece of content that was talking about um, the delineation between B2B and B2C actually kind of not being so clear. Um, and yeah, I wanted to see if you guys had thoughts on that in terms of content-wise, the way you market to B2C or B2B, and whether that is in fact becoming closer. I'm very much B2B, so you guys are probably... Yeah, I certainly think with content, like you can, you can target B2C on LinkedIn, um, especially if you're targeting like high income bracket or you know, a certain um, type of um, professional. Uh, with B2C lead generation campaigns, I always look for leverage opportunities, so distribution networks, partnership opportunities, things like that where other businesses can, you can create leverage. Um, but there's definitely strategies that work, you just gotta be strategic about it. Um, I'm, I'm in the B2C space, I'm not in the B2B space. So, mm. so for me, when I'm creating content um, and I've got my foundation property content once a week, I'm thinking about what kind of issues are people um, staying up at night with? You know, what's, what's causing them not to go to sleep? Uh, what are their biggest pain points? And I'm addressing them. You know, so I'll just write down a list of all the biggest issues that I think people are facing um, in terms of buying property, their biggest fears, what are their biggest hesitations? Um, and with that, you can have a good half a page of content, um, every, single, every single line being a separate video that you can address. Um, for B2C specifically, that's how I target. So I don't know if you, did you want to know something more about B2B or was it specifically B2C? Oh, it's more, more, more sense that there's not that like delineation between the mentality of the way you market towards one or the other. And it's actually, um, in this report, it was actually using the word B2E, which is business yeah. So, yeah. yeah, 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 and and look, I think the reason for that is people buy from people. Um, you're putting yourself out there on LinkedIn as a person, not necessarily as a business. You may be representing a business, but it's your personal brand. If people buy, it's because they're interested in your personal brand. They're interested in, and they, res you know, they they um, you know align with your personal values and and what you're putting out there. Um, so I don't think there needs to be a massive difference between B two B and B two C in terms of content on LinkedIn. 
Um, but if we're talking, let's say, content on websites, obviously that needs to be a lot more professional and that needs to be a lot more targeted to, you know, whatever industry you're specifically targeting. But they're after you. You know, they're after your content for you. So I think, yeah, I think that's a very good point you're making as we become more transparent um, in business, like B2B, B2C, it doesn't matter. There's probably less of a distinction. So I think it's a really good, really, really good question. Um, and I'd say it's just uh, subsequent to the fact that we are becoming more transparent. So customers, whether it's in a B2B scenario or B2B, are more informed than they've ever been before. So in that respect, there's, you know, I think the old days of giving these guys this information, those ones that information. Um, I mean, it's very, you know, the online... Um, um, arena is very open in that respect so you can't really get away with disclosing a little bit of information to this set of customers and then other customers on this end of the um, the food chain if you like you have to be transparent to everyone so very good question we've got another one here Hi, um, I've got a two-part question so the, the, the first is how much of your following was built off um, outbound connecting to people and then the second is, um, me personally, I've always had the business philosophy of doing business with people who I know, like, and trust. So I'm, very, I'm personally very resistant to accepting a whole bunch of inbound requests. Um, I usually like connecting with people I've actually met or there's some sort of connection to what they do or they write a really good intro. Um, mm. But you'll, ne you'll never build a huge following that way. So I'm curious what you guys think about those uh, two questions. So I think um, that second piece is, yeah, how do you decide who you connect with? I'll, I'll give my two cents and I'll, I'll pass around to get everyone's opinion. Um, I connect with targeted people um, that I find myself. Um, if targeted people that happen to fall within my demographic and audience are trying to connect with me, then brilliant. Um, that's great. Um, I've got the philosophy where I'll connect with targeted people and I don't care who follows me. Right? Uh, anybody can follow me. Uh, but the people that I have in my connection base are people that I know are people that are within my target audience. Um, I'd probably <coughs> say about 30, 40% of my following is um, connections and people that I've personally connected with and the rest are people that have just choose to follow me. Okay, And, and you absolutely can get uh, following by making sure you're targeted um, as long as you're either being, um, you know, providing educational content entertaining content and uplifting content. And in doing each one of those, you can get people to know, like, trust you and, and gravitate towards you. Um, again, it's being consistent with your content, making sure you gravitate towards a piece of content that resonates with you, whether it's video or posting um, texts or um, images, whatever it might be. Um, so, oh, first part of your question, um, the percentage of my follow uh, connections that I've built myself I like definitely like the first half like I definitely was proactive and like it was mainly me doing outreach so it's very targeted in that way and I think that's a really good way to do it I don't know what your objective is per se but if you're looking to grow a business and generate leads like being in control with who's in your network is really important um, a lot of content creators will just sit there and accept reject accept reject and they wonder why they got a poor quality network because they actually had no control over who was in it to start with. So I think it's really important if, you, if that is your objective. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's basically the, the main point that I think that I'm, I can add, yeah. Oh, just very quickly, I'd say for me, it's, it's, I'm quite strategic in who I'll allow into my network because I don't want just, like you said, a lot of poor quality people. So generally, I will either pick people who are in an industry that's going to be relevant to me or secondarily, which is something... I feel a bit like dirty about, but I'll like go onto their profile, see if there's someone who comments and likes a lot of posts. And if there's someone who's really active, has a big following, then I'll allow them into my network. So that's like a bit of like the dirty marketing <laughs> side, which makes me feel a bit gross, but Inside I feel like, like it works. Yeah. I, I'd add one thing. I know myself personally, what I did was, um, um, I was getting a ton of connection requests um, and I don't, the volume, I don't have the time to sort through. Um, so what I did was change the default button on my profile to follow instead of connect um, so that people were prompted to in the first instance follow me instead of sending me a connection request. Um, so that way it's sort of open slather, anyone can come and follow me, um, but it sort of created that added level of, um, I suppose, friction for someone to send me a connection request. Um, so you're probably more likely to attract the people you want to connect with um, on a, a from a business perspective um, versus a follower perspective, if that makes sense. Did anyone else have any more questions? We've got one more, and then we'll have to wrap it up. I just wanted to ask um, 
about having a business page as a personal page and with the use of the business <coughs> one and share and I think it would be very confused all that kind of thing. I think Amy and Beck would be great for that. Business page versus personal page. Yeah, for sure. So um, I have both, but I, I lead with my personal page. So I think I started with the most following on the personal page and I've sort of built that up over time. Um, as we were saying before, I think people connect with people more and want to do business with people. So I kind of lead my business page through that. So I still post through my business page when I'm doing really specific work that's, you know, I want to share a workshop that I run or something like that. And I'll often sort of share that. So they, the two of them link. Um, but I will, you know, put more of my energy and focus into my personal page. Did you have anything you wanted to add back or anyone else? Um, I'd be similar, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. So one last question from me. Uh, uh, number one tip to everyone in the audience who um, is preparing to start sharing content, particularly video content, what would your piece of advice be? Do it even if you feel scared um, because it's not as bad as what you think um, and there is a really supportive community um, like we were saying on LinkedIn and people will surprise you. There's more support out there for you when you're getting going um, than you ever even realise. So just get started. Um, mine is uh, authenticity. You know, just go out there, be yourself. Um, like I said, it's a very forgiving platform. What you'll find is people will gravitate towards you that should be um, gravitating towards you. Um, anyone that doesn't like you generally should not be um, associated <laughs> with either yourself or your business anyway. But be yourself, be authentic, and just put yourself out there. Um, believe me, you will not regret it. Uh, my number one piece of advice would be um, it's not about you, just to get out of your own head and focus on the people that you're serving um, and to focus on adding value. <laughs> that was literally all three of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drive and post videos on LinkedIn because that's the point. <laughs> Don't drink and post. <laughs> but I think, true, the authenticity, like be yourself because you've probably got something really wonderful to offer the world and I think it's a really great opportunity mm. to let that out. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you very much to our panel.